In this video, we're going to look at the spectrum of discrete time or sampled signals. Our objective is to use the spectrum as a tool to represent sampled signals as a function of frequency. We will relate the sampled signal spectrum to a continuous time signal spectrum and also use the sample signal spectrum to reconstruct a continuous time signal spectrum. We're going to begin by looking at complex sinusoids. So we'll define a complex sinusoid e to the j 2 pi f naught t and in the complex plane this sinusoid can be visualized as a vector that's rotating at f naught hertz or f naught complete revolutions per second. If I look at the projection on the real axis, then I have a cosine. And the spectrum of this complex exponential is a single component at frequency f naught. If we look at a discrete time complex sinusoid, e to the j 2 pi f naught hat n, where f naught hat is our discrete time frequency or a digital frequency, and that's measured in cycles per sample. So I can visualize this complex sinusoid in the complex plane also, and I have a sequence of samples that are separated by 2 pi times f naught hat radians. Each sample makes a f naught hat cycle step. In the case that I've shown here, between sample n equals 0 and sample n equal 1, we're taking about uh, one-sixth of a cycle, and then we move the same distance, another one-sixth of a cycle between sample 1 and sample 2, and each sample, the distance from the previous one, is f naught hat cycles. And this corresponds to samples of a cosine on the real axis. And one thing that's really important about discrete time spectra is that discrete time frequencies f hat and f hat plus l can't be distinguished. And that's because if I take a step of f hat, that's identical to taking a step of f hat plus 1. In other words, going one extra revolution and ending up here, or f hat plus 2, or going f hat minus 1. And you can show that algebraically by showing that e to the j 2 pi parentheses f hat plus l parentheses times n. We have e to the j 2 pi f hat n times e to the j 2 pi l times n. Well, this is always an integer multiple of 2 pi, and therefore e to the j integer multiple of 2 pi is exactly 1, and I end up showing that it's exactly equal to e to the j 2 pi f hat n. Because of this ambiguity associated with adding or subtracting extra ro complete rotations, we're going to restrict f hat to be in the interval minus 0.5 to plus 0.5. And that means we're going to consider f hat to be cycles up to the negative real axis in the positive direction or in the negative direction to the negative real axis. Consequently, my spectrum is going to show up at frequency f naught hat, and that's going to be in between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So let's apply this idea to a cosine. And here we're going to use cosine of 2 pi times 0 0.3 times n. Well, I can expand that using the Euler representation for the cosine as 1 half e to the j 2 pi times 0 0.3 n plus 1 half e to the j 2 pi times minus 0 0.3 n. This has two components in the spectrum one at plus 0.3, and the amplitude is one half of that component, and then there's another one at minus 0.3. Now in this case, both of these frequencies are within the range minus a half to a half. Now let's look at a second example. We'll call this x2 of n, and in this case we're going to use cosine of 2 pi times 0.7 n. Expand that using the Euler representation again, and we see now that our discrete time frequencies are greater than 0.5 and less than minus 0.5. So there's actually complex exponentials of lower frequencies that are equivalent to these. And it's easy to find that by looking at what this means in the complex plane. Well, e to the j 2 pi times 0.7 n corresponds to a rotation of 2 pi times 0.7 
radians from the real axis, or 0.7 of a cycle. And that's equivalent to rotating in the opposite direction, 0.3 of a cycle, or 2 pi times negative 0.3 radians. e to the j 2 pi times 0.7 n is equal to e to the j 2 pi times negative 0.3 n. And this frequency is within the bounds, minus 0.5 to 0.5, and thus is the lowest frequency complex sinusoid that's consistent with this set of samples. So when I expand my cosine, I'm going to replace e to the j 2 pi 0.7 n with e to the j 2 pi minus 0.3 times n. Then my complex sinusoid with frequency minus 0.7, turns out you can go through the same process and you find that that maps to 0.3 cycles per sample. Sketch the spectrum now, and I have a term at minus 0.3 and another one at plus 0.3. So even though this has a different frequency, it's 0.7, it has the same spectrum as a sinusoid with frequency 0.3. And that's because these two sinusoids have the exact same set of samples. It's a consequence of sinusoids in discrete time not being unique with respect to frequency. There are many frequencies that lead to the exact same sinusoid. Well, next we're going to start with a continuous time signal and sample that signal and see how the spectrum changes. So I'm going to use as an example x of t be 3 cosine 2 pi times 1 t plus cosine 2 pi times 7 t plus pi over 4. We can expand this in terms of the Euler representations for the two cosines, and we find that we have components 3 half at plus 1 hertz and minus 1 hertz, and then at plus 7 hertz, we have e to the j pi over 4 divided by 2, and then at minus 7 hertz, which I'm showing in green, we have e to the minus j pi over 4 divided by 2, and that's this component of the spectrum. If I sample this signal with a sampling interval of one-tenth, I can replace t by t sub s times n, and I obtain 3 halves e to the j 2 pi times 0.1 n, plus 3 halves e to the j 2 pi times minus 0.1 n, plus e to the j pi over 4 times e to the j 2 pi times 0 0.7 n, plus e to the minus j pi over 4 divided by 2 times e to the j 2 pi times minus 0.7 n. Now these last two terms are not in the interval between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So there's actually lower frequency complex exponentials that have the identical samples. And those are the ones we're going to use in our spectrum. We saw a moment ago that e to the j 2 pi times 0.7 n is equivalent to e to the j 2 pi times minus 0.3 n, and similarly that e to the j 2 pi times minus 0.7 n is equivalent to e to the j 2 pi times 0.3 n. So now we can sketch our spectrum. The coefficient in front of e to the j 2 pi 0.3 n, which is e to the minus j pi over 4 divided by 2, that shows up at 0.3 whereas the coefficient in front of minus 0.3 cycles per sample, e to the j pi over 4 divided by 2, now shows up in negative frequencies because frequency plus 0.7 maps to minus 0.3. And of course, the terms that were at 0.1 remain at 0.1 because this is within the interval minus 0.5 to 0.5. Now, if we were to reconstruct this signal looking in continuous time, what we'd find is that these values correspond to cosine 2 pi 3t minus pi over 4. So this is an example where we have aliasing, and you can verify that you can verify that the highest frequency present, 7 hertz, and our sampling interval is 1 tenth, so our sampling frequency is 10 hertz, and 10 hertz is not 2 times the highest frequency. The highest, two times the highest frequency would be 14 hertz. So we violated the conditions of the sampling theorem. So we can look at the sampled signal spectrum in general. If I write x of t as a sum of n cosines, 
with amplitudes AK and phases VK. I can expand those in terms of the Euler representation and combine the amplitude AK and phase terms in front of the two complex sinusoids. Now if I'm going to sample this signal, then where I have FK times T, I'm going to obtain FK times T sub S times N because I've sampled the signal at times N T sub S. We're going to inspect each of these frequencies, FK T sub S, to see if they lie in our lowest frequency range of minus 0.5 to 0.5. So I'm going to take FK T sub S. Is it within this interval? If it's not, I'm going to wrap it to be back in that interval. So like the example I've shown here, if FK T sub S wrapped is 0.8 cycles, then that's equivalent to negative 0.2 cycles per sample. And similarly, negative FK T sub S is going to wrap to the negative of FK hat. So once I've done that, then I can obtain my spectrum for my sampled signal. And I will rewrite this in terms of FK hat now. So the spectrum x of f hat has this coefficient a k e to the j phi k divided by 2 at f k hat. So we've looked at finding the spectrum of a signal when we sample. Let's suppose that we have a set of samples and we want to find the spectrum after we do reconstruction. In other words, we convert the signal from discrete time form back to continuous time form. So here, I've sketched out a spectrum of a discrete time signal. I'm assuming complex amplitudes alpha k at frequencies f k hat. And therefore, since this is a real valued signal, the coefficient at the negative frequency has to be the complex conjugate of the coefficient at the positive frequency. And so I've sketched the spectrum down here. And you notice I'm assuming that all of these f hats are between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So to do reconstruction, we're going to use the relationship that our sample frequency, f hat k, is equal to a continuous time frequency, f k, times t sub s. This implies that if I am given a sample frequency, f hat k, that my continuous time frequency, f sub k, is equal to f hat k divided by t sub s, or in terms of the sampling frequency, it's equal to f hat k times f sub s. So we can use this relationship to map these frequencies to their continuous time counterparts. Graphing the spectrum of x of f, we have components at f1, f2, and f3 in the example I've shown. Our general expression involves components with complex amplitudes alpha k at frequency f k and alpha k complex conjugate at frequency minus fk. So we can use the spectrum to understand the impact of sampling as well as understand the impact of reconstruction.